Right, okay, I think I think we can start. It's 25 to 6. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. This is our first webinar and we're very, very excited to see you. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name is Angelina and I'm the Programme Manager for UK uh, Postgraduate Awards. Um, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Samuel Thompson, who's the uh, Programme Manager for UK Scholar Awards, and Tom Chadwick, who's the uh, Programmes Assistant. Um, so I will be leading the webinar today and my colleagues have kindly agreed to help me with the questions. So just very briefly about what we will be doing today. Uh, so the main focus of the event is for you to have an opportunity to ask us questions um, and obviously ask to provide more information to you. Um, I have also prepared a short presentation which should be between 15 and 20 minutes. Now this presentation does not cover you know, everything about everything. Uh, we will be running more webinars and obviously we want to produce new content. So today I will be primarily discussing some of the things which I think you may want to think about before you start um, sort of uh, submitting your application, uh, before you start providing information to us. Um, and then, you know, I will spend about up to 20 minutes on this and then you will have about 40 uh, minutes to ask us questions. Uh, regarding the questions, um, I will be asking you to use the uh, question option box. Uh, please do wait until the end of my presentation um, and then we'll start take, uh, taking your questions. Um, right, so just a moment. I will start sharing my screen with you in a moment. Excellent, here we go. Right, that's not what this is supposed to be. This is what this is supposed to be. So, um, normally when we start our webinars, we tell you a little bit more about uh, who we are, what the Fulbright Commission does and what it is. But I thought today I will start um, our webinar slightly differently. Um, I may be here because of Fulbright, but you are here because you have at least considered the option of studying in the US. And when we do so, one of the main things which tend to come up uh, is the costs associated with studying um, in the US. And it is indeed the case that studying in the US is expensive. Uh, very often it's much more expensive than doing your postgraduate degree um, in the UK. Having said that, it does not necessarily mean that um, education in the US is um, unachievable and attainable unless you happen to come from a very privileged background. Uh, so one of the things for you to think about, obviously the first thing is your personal savings, maybe some family support, although we do appreciate the fact that uh, not everyone has access to that. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you will find commercial loans. Now there is no harm in looking into those uh, and checking if you're eligible for one, but we would probably recommend that you consider that your last resort. Commercial loans can end up being very, very expensive unless you're able to pay them off quite quickly. Uh, so the two main forms of, um, sort of health financial support are the scholarships uh, provided directly by your host institution and external funding bodies such as us. So when considering the options which are available to you, you really need to be strategic about that. Uh, it's obviously great to have an Ivy League institution in your CV, Having said that, it does not necessarily mean that this will give you the best education available. So we strongly encourage to look, you to look beyond the Ivy League. Um, beyond the Ivy League, um, if there is a very sort of specific course you want to do, there is a likelihood that there will be at least a few U.S. institutions which will be offering something very, very similar, uh, but the costs may be very, very different. So you know. It may be great to go and live in New York, the experience will be fantastic. Having said that, you may want to also think about going to Indiana or Florida or Texas, where you, know, you may be able to enroll on you know, another fantastic course, but your um, cost of living will be very different, much lower. Um, if, if you're you know, really determined if you're setting going to New York, fair enough, you will have to accept the fact that your cost of living are going to be high, but do look at different uh, universities, be flexible, shop around, because you're very likely to come across very different fees. Another thing to keep in mind is that you really need to be prepared. If you're applying for multiple things, are you places at universities, uh, external funding bodies, maybe some um, forms of scholarship from the university, uh, there will be different deadlines and it will be your responsibility 
to sort of know when your deadlines are and what to submit and when. Uh, it does require quite a lot of work, quite a lot of time. So this is something you should start thinking about quite early, but it's definitely worth it. You can you can save a lot of money. Now, um, this is just kind of a general introduction to the options available to you. Um, I'm, as an awards um, manager, um, can't really advise in detail on sort of like various options available to you. So if you would like to have a sort of detailed discussion about um, different funding opportunities or January studying in the US, uh, we would definitely encourage you to contact our Education USA advising team who provide free and advice advice. Uh, you can find their contact details on our website and there will be a slide at the end of this presentation with more information on how to contact them. So, so far so good. And where, where do we come in? So the Fulbright Awards Programme was established by Senator J. William Fulbright after the Second World War, who believed that uh, through educational exchange, international education exchange, people could foster peace, understanding, stability and prosperity. Now, that happened a long time ago, and a lot of things have changed since then. Having said that, we are still taking forward the idea that your eagerness, your keenness to engage with the other, whether within academia or outside of it, uh, is really is hugely beneficial to the direct participants of this exchange, um, as well as the wider community. Therefore, every year we award about 40 grants to UK citizens. Uh, this is both uh, postgraduate and school awards. These awards can be used to study any postgraduate course at any uh, US university or higher educational institution, as long as it is accredited. Um, and scholars can use that towards either teaching um, or doing research. Um, the courses must be full time. So the main reason why you are in the US must be studying, although you know you can get like a part time job or do something else in addition to your studying. And they must be in person, subject to global contexts. Um, so this is this is just an overview um, of, of the awards we offer. Now I'm not going to go through every single one of them in detail because it's going to be boring and it is available on the website. There are just a few things I do want to point out. So as you can see the awards are grouped. Um, you will notice that some of our grants are discipline specific. So for example, uh, you can do a um, course in journalism and apply for our Alistair Cook Award anywhere, anywhere in the US. Uh, we also have partnerships with specific U.S. institutions, such as Brown University or Indiana University, where you know you, if if you want to go to that particular institution, uh, you can apply for the award offered by that partnership. Uh, the most competitive award is the All Disciplines Postgraduate Award. It's not just one grant; it's multiple grants. I can't really confirm how many it would be because it does depend on various circumstances and various factors. Uh, but this is this is not um, a tuition fee waiver. So uh, the All Disciplines Postgraduate Award um, offers um, a specific amount of money, which is up to forty-five thousand dollars, which is normally not enough to cover your full tuition fees. So you will be expected to have an additional finances in place to be able to afford study in the US. Um, other awards, again, if, if you look um, um, on our website, you will see that some awards offer full tuition fee waiver, some offer um, a grant, um, others offer a tuition fee waiver um, and a stipend. Similarly, we have a very nice selection of scholar awards. Um, as I've mentioned before, this is for the academics who would like to go to the US to teach uh, or do some research. The main difference in terms of the package we have offer is uh, the fact that all scholar awards come with a stipend and your grant depends on the duration of, of your sort of teaching um, or your research. Obviously, the main reason why people apply to us is to get financial support and that's perfectly fine. This is, this is why we're here. However, Fulbright is not just about you know, getting money to go to the US. If you go to a different uh, country, you obviously undergo cultural immersion. You get acquainted with a new culture. You learn how to handle culture shock, which is not necessarily what you expect when you are planning to go to the US. A lot of people assume that everything is going to be very, very similar. Well, it's very unlikely to be the case. Um, at the admin level, we provide a lot of assistance with your um, visa paperwork. So as a school, as, as a Fulbright uh, school or postgraduate um, 
Award holder, you will be going to the US on J1 visa and we will be guiding you through the whole process of, of acquiring the visa and then departing uh, to the US. And when you are in the US, you will have an advisor from the Institute of International Education who will be uh, providing guidance to you throughout the whole period of your study in the US. And obviously, when you receive your grant, when everything has been confirmed, you become a member of the global Fulbright community. That means that there will be various events for you uh, before, during and after your grant. Um, you, we, we were also very keen on sort of engaging with our alumni, on, on keeping in touch with them. So they help us with outreach, they help us with uh, interviewing, with reading applications. So there will be multiple opportunities for you to, keep, uh, to stay in touch with us if, if you would like to. Uh, we also have a relatively new app, which is called Fulbright. And this is an opportunity for our grantees uh, to communicate with all Fulbrighters from across the world, share their ideas, maybe come up with projects and see where that takes them. Now, as I've said, this webinar is not about everything, and I'm not going to look uh, in detail at the actual application process or recruitment, although you're more than welcome to ask questions about that. There are a few things, however, which I would like to highlight. Um, so first of all, there are instructions available on our website, and it is important that you read them. When you submit your application, you will be doing so through the online system, which is used by all commissions in the world. And different commissions ask for different things. So to know what you are expected to do, you do need to refer to our instructions. Uh, the application form itself is quite long, so please do not feel discouraged. Try to create an account as early as you can, look at the information you're required to submit and start filling in it early. Um, so you have until um, 9th of November to do so. We do not look at the applications uh, before the deadline. Uh, so um, the deadline, there is, so there is, we do have a deadline, as I've said, it's 9th of November, 5 p.m. And there is a reason why we have it. We are unable to be flexible, which means that if you're late, unfortunately, you are late. It doesn't matter whether it's five minutes, five hours, five days, a dog ate your computer, you know, your referee has not provided a reference, something else happened. Unless it's a technical issue on our side, which has happened before, uh, you do have to submit your application before the deadline. Um, I've already mentioned the uh, referees, and that tends to be one of the sort of more common reasons why our applicants experience delays. So you will be expected to submit three references. Um, and the way it works is you will input three email addresses um, and the referees will receive uh, instructions on uh, the deadline, how to submit a reference, the options they have, and you know, are there other information, also the contact details of the, of, of basically our contact details in case they experience any technical issues. Now it is your responsibility to make sure that your referee has the email, that they know what they're doing, they know the deadline and they're happy with everything. Uh, so, if I were you, I would probably start thinking about your referees now um, and potentially start contacting uh, them to see if they're available. Maybe they're on a sabbatical, maybe they're not willing to give you a reference. There are different circumstances. So, please think about that. Uh, and the last thing, again, we get lots of questions about that. You can apply for one award only through one commission only. So do you read the descriptions, do you read the requirements and make sure that you understand what you're expected to do. If you're unsure, if something is not clear, do you get in touch and we will be, um, we'll be happy to help. Our um, applications are very competitive. Uh, so please do make sure that you read the instructions. Um, so as I've said, there is lots of information you can find on our website. If you have any questions, uh, you're very welcome to email us directly and we'll help you. Uh, I look specifically after one of, of the programs, um, as, as do my colleagues. So we do not provide general advice on funding and study in the US. If this is what you would like to discuss, please contact our advising team. You can email them at advising at fulbright.org.uk. You can also submit an inquiry through our website or you can give them a call. Now they accept calls on specific days at specific times. So please look this up on our website. That's it from me for now. And now we, are, um, we, we can take questions. I will stop sharing the screen. Let me just get out of here. I can see that we have some questions. Okay. 
uh, and she'll be ready for the, the, uh, the, I think the first question is a quite a common question, which is, um, do you need to have an offer from the institution that you're applying to before you apply to Fulbright? Right, so the short answer to this question is no. Now, you do need to think about where you want to be and where you want to go, because this is actually, this goes back to that kind of full situation about you reading the instructions. The online system will tell you that you should not be mentioning any institutions in your study objections. Now, our instructions tell you in bold underline that this is absolutely what you have to be doing. Otherwise, your application basically won't be considered. So you need to have thought about the university you would like to go to and why you would like to go to uh, and, and explain that in your um, in one of your submission documents. Um, can I add the scholar side of that as well? So. The scholar side of this is a little bit different because you're not applying, you're not a degree seeking student on the scholar side. Um, your application has to require evidence that you started making hosting arrangements. So that means that some applications will come with a uh, letter from their host university on the university letterhead. Others will just give evidence of an email exchange with a potential host academic. But either way, you need to have provided evidence that that conversation is taking place because without a host um, in place, then your application is considered ineligible. So it's really important that you've made that contact at the very least between yourself and a host institution. Kind of uh, following on from that slightly, we've got a couple of questions about references, which I'm going to try to put together. So the first is that um, for your referees, is it possible, uh, is it preferable for the, all of them to be academic or can you have a one non-academic reference? Another person is asking whether or not you can get a reference letter from a professor based at the university you want to go to. I imagine that's probably going to have different answers for the two uh, programs. Yeah, so I, just to kind of uh, repeat in case anyone missed that, um, I look after postgraduate awards and like the information I provide is specifically for uh, the students who would like and do some postgraduate study and my colleague Samuel uh, provides advice on, on uh, the school awards. So regarding postgraduate study, um, it's, it doesn't have to come from free academics. Um, a lot of our applicants also work full-time or part-time, so it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, we do expect at least one of your uh, referees to be an academic because ultimately you're going to the US to do academic work. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, reference from someone in the US, we've had that before and that's perfectly fine. Do you keep in mind that they are, and again, it really depends on your relationship with that person, we do expect someone to be able to comment on your academic work or your work habits so far. So if you've already worked with them, for example, that's perfectly fine. If they just want to comment on the application you've submitted to the university, that's probably, it's going to be a good addition to your application. So please feel free to submit it. But we will probably still want to have three uh, references from three people who have extensively worked with you, either in sort of a professional or an academic capacity. Um, so on the scholar side, uh, you, they don't all need to be academic, but obviously if you are applying for uh, academic research grant, it would help if all three references are academic. But if your research is highly linked to industry, perhaps someone that you've worked with in that industry might be able to provide a very strong reference for you. Um, and then on the other hand, some of our awards are entirely professional. So I'm thinking, for instance, of the Welsh Public Service Award. Uh, it is unlikely that you'd have three academic references for this award, so we wouldn't expect to see three academic references. Um, you could have a reference uh, from someone at your chosen host university, but I would say that if it's the person who is also going to be your host academic, you shouldn't confuse that reference with the invitation letter. The invitation letter is a separate piece of evidence for your application. And that reference is an opportunity for someone else, whether they're at that university, at your home university, or someone else that you've worked with elsewhere to provide a reference for your application. It's not a second opportunity to put in an invitation. Great. Um, there are also quite a few questions about the competitivity of the uh, different awards and like the sort of the success rate and the typical numbers of applicants. So I wonder if you could both just speak to, you know, how, what, what, you know, the, the sort of competitiveness of the awards. Um, sure. I mean, we get asked this question every single year and there is no sort of one sentence answer and I will explain why. So as 
you're probably aware we have a lot of different awards and it really really depends on what award we're talking about if it's something very specific for example uh the phd at brown university or a public policy program um at minnesota obviously you're going to have fewer um applications uh than for example all disciplines one simply because you know the audience is very very different uh while when it comes to the all disciplines award because you can use it pretty much anywhere anywhere and everywhere we receive hundreds of applications for that particular award um i yeah i guess the only the only information i can provide about postgraduate awards is that we tend to receive a few hundred applications per year that is for all awards and our cohort is on average between 20 and 25 students this, this is specifically uh regarding students postgraduate mm -hmm. students on the scholar side, uh, looking at last year, we had um, upwards of 70 applications and we made 18 offers of awards this year. Um, and it's the same on the, uh, on the scholar side as, as what Angelina said. So to reiterate, if you're looking at something very specialized like the Urology Foundation Award, that kind of, uh, the, number of the number of people that you're going to be applying against is much smaller than if you were to apply for the All Disciplines Award. That's great. Um, we've got a question about whether or not we offer a specific award for doing an MBA, which I think is one for Angelina to answer. Um, yeah, so we do have a few entrepreneurship awards. Actually, one of them is the new one, so please go and have a look. It's a very generous award. Uh, so if you would like to do an MBA at Harvard, we have a specific award for that. Uh, we have an, a, a, the new entrepreneurship award, which is for any MBA other than the Harvard one, because we have a special one for, for the Harvard um, course. Um, and then we also have um, an award, which is um, Sir Cyril Taylor uh, Social Entrepreneurship Award. Uh, that does not necessarily have to be an MBA, but it can be if you want to. Um, there's, an, there's another question about MBAs, which I'm follow up with, which is um, someone's interested in the British Friends of Harvard Business School Award. Yeah. Um, they ask, could you provide more information on how much this is based off financial need? Um, so the information we can provide is available on our website, but the final decision is made by the by the our partners. So we are not really involved in that side of, of affairs. So I think the, the information we provide is generally uh, you considered as sort of in need of financial support if for that particular award if you earn under fifty thousand pounds per year uh having said that would you look at you know the we look at all applications regardless we primarily assess your kind of application which obviously doesn't tell us how much you earn uh so uh it, if, if you earn more than that, it doesn't necessarily mean that your application will not be considered. It may mean that, you know, the award will be readjusted accordingly, but as I've said, the final decision will be made by the partner. Um, one for Sam. Uh, sure. Do you need to have a PhD uh, before you apply for a scholar award? It really depends on the award in question. So uh, a lot of the academic or teaching related awards would require you to have a PhD. Um, however, if you look at the instructions on our website, it does suggest that for some awards, um, a, a similar professional degree would suffice. So if you're a practicing medical doctor or you have a law degree, then you may be able to apply for the awards without a PhD. Um, similarly, some of our awards are entirely professional focused. So we've got things like our public sector award that don't require you to have a PhD. Um, so look at the award, read the website instructions and uh, work it out um, from there. But something like the All Disciplines Award or the Elon University Award would generally require you to have a PhD. Great, um, thanks so much everyone for these questions. We're gonna do our best to get through them. Um, so one for Angelina, um, someone's asking if the process for applying for a postgraduate award is the same if you're applying to do a LLM or a PhD as it is for if you're doing a master's, applying to yes. do a master's. It it's, it's the same application. Uh, you're obviously like, if you're applying to do a PhD, obviously the expectations are different in terms of your, you know, the depth of your academic proposal. So do keep that in mind. So we will be assessing kind of not just what we see on paper, but obviously what you're planning to do. But in terms of the actual application uh, and the link and what you're expected to submit, it, it is pretty much the same. Um, 
And there was also you know, a question about the actual application components itself. So someone's asking what the length of the personal statement and research objectives parts of the application should be in terms of word count or page count. Um, I guess that's applicable to you both, but I think the answer will be the same. Yeah, so there is no word count for us. Uh, there is a page limit. It's two pages per research uh, objective and one page uh, for your personal statement. Um, and again, one that I think either of you could speak to is that if you are uh, looking at two awards, one of which is a partner award or there is the All Disciplines Award, which one would you recommend applying to? I cannot recommend because it really depends on your profile. I can only tell you that the All Disciplines one is guaranteed to be more competitive. I would say that um, whilst, I, whilst I can't recommend it um, either way, there is some potential for applying for a partner award um, if it's one of the broader partner awards and then being considered potentially as an all disciplines candidate if if not successful for that award but that's that's a very rare circumstance so I think 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 about whether you're think very carefully about whether your application fits with one of our partner awards objectives because I do think those can be um, very rewarding experiences because as Angelina has pointed out, they are less competitive. So. Um, another, uh, yeah, another question, this one about um, whether or not there are any kind of preferences regarding which universities people either have attended or worked for. And is, is there a preference for Russell Group universities when, they, when applying to Scott Fulbright Awards? Absolutely not. No, nope. um, I suppose we could say that there is a preference for a strong case made for host university. Um, but that's that's based on your application, right? That is, how am I framing how my research or my degree fits well with the aims, the values, the research done at a university that I'm putting down as my host or uh, that I'm applying to. But that is that's a different case than we give preference to a certain university. Um, someone is asking whether or not there have been adjustments for in-person attendance due to COVID nineteen. Uh, yeah, whether or not, I don't know whether this is referring to this year or whether or not it's thinking about next year's awards programme. So it would be difficult for us to talk about obviously the next year. I can talk a little about what has happened so far. So there has been a lot going on. Um, in terms of the in-person attendance element, um, a lot of the US universities are offering a hybrid mode when students attend a certain amount of classes. And if this is the case, they are expected to go to the US. So I w I've already had a few students depart and more going next week. Having said that, quite a lot of universities have chosen to go fully online for at least the autumn uh, term, in which case this year, as an, ex as an exception, we've allowed um, our grantees to start their programs remotely from the UK and they're being fully supported in terms of they're getting their grant in full. Um, uh, another question about um, this question is about funding. So, it's, if someone is uh, already studying for a PhD that's been funded in the UK, are they able to apply for a Fulbright award to cover a year that would be spent in the United States? Uh, so, if, if I understand this correct, is this um, so? Basically, if you want to go to the US as part of your PhD, uh, that that should be fine. I think it's, I think the question, there's a couple of questions about this, are basically asking about whether or not it's okay to apply for the Fulbright alongside other pots of funding. Um, right, okay. So yes, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I would say apply for as many things as you can. Uh, it is the case that we have to make sure that our funding does not uh, duplicate any other funding sources you secure. So for example, if you secure full tuition fee through whatever, um, we will be looking at, you know, making sure that our uh, funding covers your, for example, living costs, or maybe something something in addition to that. Uh, but generally speaking, we, we definitely encourage you to apply for as, as many things as you can. And when we make those final decisions, we sort of always give you the benefit of the doubt. So we try to make sure that uh, you get as much money as, as we can give you. Um, one for Sam. Um, how are the different elements of the Scholar Award application weighted? I don't think I can give you a precise answer on that. I think we review the application holistically, so and we review it to our strengths. So at, at the commission itself, when I'm reading the application, I'm reading it for uh, the, the why Fulbright justification, the why this needs to happen in the US justification, 
um, the elements of international exchange that are put into the application. But when it's reviewed externally by um, our reading panelists, they're reviewing it with their academic expertise. And then when the interview happens, we're reviewing it with we're reviewing the interview with the strengths that the interviewers bring to the table as well. So I, I don't think there's any precise, each section is weighted like this, um, but it, it's, it's all read holistically. So make sure that the care that you're putting into your research statement is being put into your CV and being put into who you're asking for references um, because we do read everything. Kind of following on from that slightly, there's a question about who reads the applications and whether or not they will be technical experts in the field. Um, and so, sort of, you know, so do they need to keep, um, should, should the application, what kind of audience should the application be written uh, in some, with in mind? So I made a complete mess of that question. It was written much more eloquently in the box. Right, I, th I think you know, I know where we're going with this. <laughs> so in terms of who reads the applications, um, lots of people will read your application. So it will be read by the experts by at least two to three people who specialize in your field. Uh, because we're looking for different things, not just academic excellence. It will be reviewed by a number of uh, staff members, and then it will be all applications will be reviewed in addition to that uh, by the program manager. And then if there are very different views, which happens, uh, it can go up to the awards director and then go, goes back to the program manager. So there are lots of discussions taking place to make sure that our um, kind of evaluation is as kind of even handed as possible. The the panel experts are also all Fulbright alums, so they bring their experience of, of Fulbright to the table as well um, when reading that. Was there was there a second part to that question? Oh, it was how, how to write for the audience. Reading. So I, I think because we do have expert panelists, don't shy away from using expert language um, and for making your research as as targeted to um the field as as you wish uh, but i also think that there is a great strength in being able to communicate your research to people who are unfamiliar with your field because part of fulbright as a as a program is ambassadorship and part of that is how do you represent the field that you're in so I think that's the strength of a, of a good application, is how well do they communicate what they're saying. Quite a few questions asking if it's possible to apply for an award if you haven't been based in academia, but you've been working. Um, I think it's probably a place to both of you. Mm. So, um, in terms of the postgraduate awards, uh, so would you require every, all applicants to hold um, a bachelor's degree? So as long as you have that, you will be able to apply uh, for what, at least one, well, I mean, everyone has one, but at least something will work for you in terms of you will meet our um, eligibility criteria. On the scholar side, um, it's a cop-out, but it depends. Um, so if you've been working in a field, so let's say you're a, a trained urologist, um, but you've not done much uh, medical academia in a while, then sure, apply for the urology award because that is where your expertise lies and this would be a great opportunity to do some research. Um, but if you're looking at one of the more academic awards, it might be more difficult to apply without that um, base in academia if you've been out of academia for a little while. But I, I wouldn't discourage applying if it's something you're interested in using, perhaps as a way of getting back into academia. Just there's actually been a few more questions about applying for multiple awards. Um, I don't know whether, uh, whether, whether or not you, I think someone's asking whether or not you could apply for a postgraduate scholar award or whether that means you could cannot apply for um, two awards within one of those categories. Uh, I think I'm right in saying, you guys can correct me, that actually you need to apply for only one award from one category. And that's, you know, you'd either apply for one postgraduate scholar award, postgraduate award or one a scholar award. You cannot apply for multiple awards. And I, I suppose it's also worth clarifying that if you're not sure whether you're applying for a postgraduate or a scholar award, so for instance, if you're in your last year of your PhD and you would receive your PhD before you would start your grant, you should be looking at applying for a scholar award, a scholar award rather than applying for a uh, research postgraduate award. Um, but if you're a little earlier in your, in your academic career and you've got a few more years of your PhD left, you'd be looking at applying for that um, 
PhD researcher award. Okay. And just question. to add, uh, that let's say if you hold a master's already and you're applying for a master's award, we will expect you to explain how you feel you will benefit uh, from gaining another master's. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are ineligible, but we will expect to have that explanation in, in your um, either personal st um, statement or the research objective. Another question about, um, this is from another early career researcher, is basically asking about what we look for in terms of a publication record, and do you need to have a strong publication record before you can be considered for Fulbright Award? Uh, you don't need to have a strong publication record before you can be considered. Um, as I, I sort of explained previously, we read these applications holistically, and so we would take into account the fact that you're an early career scholar, um, and we wouldn't be expecting hundreds of publications from, from an early career scholar, and also the field is important and things like that. Um, but having having a, a strong publication record isn't going to hurt your application, but I wouldn't be put off from applying if your publication record is is still fairly short because you're a, a newer, a younger career scholar. Um, I would I would certainly advise applying still. Um, quite a straightforward one. Can you submit more than three references? Um, I think the system asks you for three email addresses. So uh, you, I think you have the option to attach some additional information. Um, and if that's, you know, the fourth reference and you really want to attach that, that's perfectly fine. But I think it, the kind of the standard field is basically for three uh, email addresses. Um, the question is asking if we have any awards that support um, diversity and marginalised backgrounds. Uh, we don't have any awards uh, specifically uh, for someone coming from a specific background. Having said that, we do have a number of initiatives. Uh, so we are very keen on making ourselves interesting and appealing to people com coming from, from different backgrounds, whether it's ethnicity, religion, uh, social class, region, it really doesn't matter. So one of the sort of new things is the Opportunity Fund, which is an additional source of funding uh, for our grantees, regardless of the award um, they have been offered. And while this uh, kind of pot of funding is available to everyone in terms of everyone is welcome to apply, we are particularly keen on supporting people uh, from the who come from the backgrounds which are underrepresented uh, at full ride. Um, another question asking if we've got any resources which provide specific guidance on how to write the research objectives and or the personal statement for the application. Um, I don't think we have anything specific on our website. Um, I personally would say there is no uh, kind of right or wrong way to do that. Do read our instructions because uh, there are like lots of bullet points which tell you include this, include that, don't do this, don't do that. So, you know, you can use that as a guide in addition to anything you can find on, on you know, the internet. Uh, we may also be able to run uh, some of the schemes soon where you will be able to request some help with sort of some maybe general advice from the people who have gone through that process, but this is still work in progress. Um, we've got another question asking about whether or not the award includes any support for dependents, such as a uh, partner or children. Uh, at the postgraduate level, no. We do provide support with getting a visa, so you will receive guidance, um, you will be told what to do, but in terms of the actual financial support, that is the responsibility of the grantee. So at the scholar level, um, the stipend doesn't change whether you're bringing dependents with you or not. Um, so you may wish to take that into account when planning where your host institution is because of taking into account things like cost of living. Um, but one of the things that we do work with as um, covered before we work on J1 visa paperwork, but that also means that we talk a little bit about J2 paper, visa paperwork, which is um, the visa paperwork for um, dependents. So while there is not necessarily uh, financial support, we can we can talk about kind of more general support for working with you and any dependents you might have. Um, we've also got a, a follow-up question for Sam, which is, um, do you need just the host as representative of the university to vouch for you? Or do you need to have the host and the university separately need to, sorry, do the host and the university separately need to confirm that they are happy for you to attend should you get the full At this stage, we just need a, a letter on uh, on university letterhead from the academic who would be hosting you in the department saying that they would be happy to host you, perhaps saying that you would have like 
office access or access to the library, um, things like that. But at this stage, it can be as, as little as evidence of communication, but we would really rather see that letter, but it, it doesn't need to be from someone central at the university. It should be from the faculty that you're looking to work with. Great, thanks. Um, we've actually got quite a number of questions about references. I'm wondering whether some people actually joined the, the, the webinar slightly later. Uh, people basically asking whether or not they would be, it would be advisable to get references from people that you've done internships or work experience with, or whether or not they can be from, whether or not they need to be purely academic. I wonder if uh, someone could maybe just repeat the answer we had on that earlier. Uh, for postgraduate, it can be a combination. Unless they are your relatives or friends, it can be an academic, it can be your employer, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, um, just say as, as well, it can be a, it can be a real mix of, of people on the scholar side um, and they, they don't even need to necessarily be academics that you've worked with if they're people who you know through conferences and through publications and things like that, um, they might wish to recommend you to. Um, someone has asked if it's possible to get one-on-one -on -one support, what kind of support we can offer in terms of the application in terms of whether or not uh, people could read the application before they apply? Unfortunately, due to the volume of inquiries and applications, we are unable to provide um, any kind of one-to-one -one support at this stage. Uh, as I said, you can email us if you have any questions, but um, as a commission, we are unable to uh, proofread um, your any, anything, basically. So it would be kind of the ownership is on you. And we've got a question from someone who um, applied last year and they would like to submit an entirely new research proposal uh, and personal statement this year. And just um, asking for sort of, uh, your, your feedback and perspective on, on that, whether it's a good idea to, uh, whether, it's, whether we encourage people to reapply basically and with a new project. Um, it's, it's entirely, so it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, we are, I mean, unless we check, we may not necessarily know that you're reapplying. Uh, so if, if you want to submit something very similar, if you want, you know, if your plans have changed and you want to submit something completely different, uh, again, for postgraduate awards, that, that works well. No, Sam, did you have anything to add to that from a scholar's perspective? If a scholar's um, looking to reapply or? I think, I think it's just worth saying that if, if this is still um, research that you're passionate about, um, and you applied last year and maybe um, wish to reuse that, but perhaps change the angle or um, hone it in some different way, that, that would still be fine. Um, or if you have a completely new project that you'd like to propose, either is fine, uh, but don't throw away a research proposal that you believe in um, just because you didn't make it last year. These are really competitive awards and perhaps a year of reflection on that proposal might be what was needed just to change it enough to. Um, and this question is, for, is about postgraduate um, and it's, it's specifically about um, awards that, that the length of uh, degree people will go and study. So do Fulbright awards support only one year uh, of an MBA or MBA or is it possible to get support for, for more years basically? So in terms of the support, the grant is the same regardless of the duration of your program. So if, for example, you offer $45,000, whether it's a one-year program or, you know, five-year PhD, it's going to be the same amount. Now, what we can do is, uh, in sort of exceptional circumstances, we can split the award to cover multiple years. So, for example, you can receive 25000 in year one and then 20000 in year two or you know, a different combination depending on your needs. But in terms of the amount, it is the same. Okay, next one. Um, and again, someone's asking if we have any postgraduate awards for law programs. Uh, specifically law, it's going to be at Indiana University. We do have a partnership with them and also all disciplines. Um, this is a question for scholars, but I think again, it's uh, would probably be relevant to both of you, which is, how do, what are the criteria that are used to determine, make the assessment? And we've kind of touched on this already, but are you looking at the excellence of the applicant, the proposal, or the, and the match between the proposal and location? What kind of things are we thinking of, are the people that look at the applications thinking about and making those decisions? Uh, for postgraduate, um, I will be very brief because my next webinar will be dedicated to this. Uh, we look for academic excellence, 
we do expect you to be a good ambassador we do expect you to be a good leader and we want to know why you are going to the us and why, why you need to be there to complete your studies basically these are this is all the instructions and and this is what literally sit there kind of ticking boxes pretty much so this is this is what we want to know when we reach your um study objective and personal statement and on why you've selected particular universities yeah i i, I think all i can do is echo what angela has said is is that Strength of strength of proposal, academic excellence, um, match with Fulbright uh, argument for host institution. I think I think those are all really important. And to to keep using this word and sound like a broken record, all of that holistically as well. Um, a couple more quick questions for Sam. Um, one of which I think we've already covered, but I'll just go through anyway. So the firstly is, do you need to have a permanent position at a UK institution for Python Scholar Award? You do not. And do you need to have a PhD at the point, have your PhD, basically at what point do you have to have your PhD in order to apply for the Scholar Award? You need to make sure that your PhD will be completed and awarded to you before the start of your grant. But if, if you do not need it awarded to you before you apply. So if you are in the last year of your PhD and your grant would start after your PhD has been awarded to you, you should apply for a scholar award. Um, but if, if it would be awarded after your proposed start grant date, you would be ineligible. Someone's just asking for clarification. So when you apply for a postgraduate award, you should outline which university and course in your application, but you shouldn't mention whether or not you have already secured or defer how to offer from that university. I think they're asking about, um, yeah, whether or not you've actually, whether or not you've actually made those applications or not. Do you have to state that in your application? You don't have to, I mean, you don't have to have applied to those universities. Uh, if you've applied, you can state. So some people uh, already mentioned that they've been over places, especially if they choose to defer from like a previous year, for example. Uh, but basically the main factor we'll be looking for uh, is your rationale for choosing specific universities, which means that, you know, you probably shouldn't be applying to 20 universities. Um. There's been a couple of questions about whether or not we have preferences in terms of discipline, whether or not we're interested in the sciences rather than the humanities. No, unless you're applying for like a partner award where you know you want to do all the awards for like journalism or you know something very specific. Um, no, not really. Yeah, um, um, sorry, really is good. Um, and so, I'm just, these are quite similar to ones we've already been asked. Um, there was a question about the, what was that one about the nurse? Thing? Yes, so at what stage in your medical training do applicants for the nursing award normally apply? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I, we receive very different, I mean, there is no rule as such. Um, and as, as long as, um, I wouldn't necessarily say, uh, I mean, yeah, basically, there is no specific answer to, to this question. So it, it depends on kind of your career plans and what you want to do. Um, for postgraduate awards, someone's asking if you need to state your other funding sources in your application. Um, at that stage, no. You will, if you're invited to the interview, uh, you will be asked about that. Uh, but would you appreciate the fact that you know very often you will start getting decisions uh, towards the summer or like mid-summer? Uh, so no, not really. That would not affect your application in, in any way. Uh, and the question asking whether or not we have uh, are there any Fulbright awards specifically to the arts, uh, whether we have partner awards in the states that's specifically for arts and artistic. Um, um, not, th not that I can think of. Uh, we may have a BAFTA award, uh, which is quite specific, but this, at, at this stage we're unable to confirm. Um, I think, no, I think that would be the, the all disciplines one. Yeah, um, at least on the scholar side, we don't have specific awards for uh, the arts or, or a specific partner university for those, but 
uh, certainly recommend applying through the All Disciplines Award to do that. Um, and previous candidates have been successful in the past in getting All Disciplines Awards for arts-based research or teaching. Um, just, um, we, we've had a lot of questions asking if, if awards uh, support specific things. Um, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues will add to this, but just one thing I would recommend is if you're looking to see the kind of range of Fulbright awards that have been given in the past, you can actually go on the website and there's a tab called Meet Our Fulbrighters. Mm -hmm. And there you'll be able to see like uh, lists and bios for all the Fulbright um, awards that have been made in the last, I think, three or so years. Um, and that will give you an idea of like the range and breadth of different Fulbright awards um, that have been offered in the past. Um, I don't know if the other, anyone else wants to. Um, yeah. I would also add, if you're interested in a partner, award, for example, Lloyd's, uh, you can go to their website and some, some of them provide information on who they have funded and what sort of work, what sort of project they've worked on. Yeah, I think I, think I saw a question about how broad is, is that risk category for Lloyd's. Um, and it's reasonably broad. I would recommend looking, I believe, on at least the Scholar Award page for Lloyd's. There's a couple of, of risk ideas outlined, if not. Their fund that this is part of the Lloyd's Tercentenary Research Fund uh, will have some information on their website, so it should be linked from the award page. Um, but look at recent awardee, the recent grantees from that Lloyd's Award to get an idea of just how broad um, grantees have successful grantees have been on that award. Um, I've got a couple of questions about um, basically where people are based. Uh, so there's a specific question about whether or not you have to be attached to a UK university to apply for the Scholar Award. I guess by extension, I could also ask Angelina whether or not you need to be based in the UK in order to apply for a Fulbright Award. So uh, you... For, for uh, postgraduate awards, um, as long as you're a UK citizen, uh, you can apply from anywhere in the world unless you are uh, in the US studying. Um, if you are not a UK citizen, but you will reside um, in, in the UK and you would like to apply, this is your permanent uh, place, this is where you live, do get in touch with us and we'll discuss your circumstances. In terms of the question about scholar awards and needing to be attached to a UK university, um, you do not need to be attached to a UK university, whether that's as in you do, you're, you're not in a permanent role at a UK university or whether you are attached to a university elsewhere in the world but are a UK citizen applying from the UK, uh, US UK Fulbright Commission, both of those are fine. The one caveat that I will add is that if you are currently employed by a US university at time of application, you would not be eligible to make your application. Um, a couple of questions about the, um, the, the formatting of the, so for instance, the statement of grant purpose and the, and the personal statement. Um, so there's a question about the header and whether there needs to be anything in that header, or whether it's, I, I, I understand it's, um, and what that purpose of that is for. And another question is about line spacing and whether or not we have a preference for line spacing and font size. I mean, there are some, again, instructions on the website. We're not going to sort of not consider your application because we don't like the spacing, to be, to be very honest. Uh, so ultimately, this is not going, as long as it doesn't affect the quality of application, which I don't think it will, it's fine. Please do follow the uh, page limit because that is important, but the rest of it is, is not going to really affect your chances of being invited to uh, the interview. Um. We've got a question about uh, whether or not, uh, like basically how other applications might affect the Fulbright application. So if this, in this particular case, uh, someone is trying to secure a postdoc in the States at the moment, but if they were to secure that postdoc, would they then have to withdraw their Fulbright application? Uh, I believe that would make you ineligible, um, especially if you start your postdoc before, any time before, um, the end of the application window, so that includes like right up into interview stage, um, because you cannot be an eligible applicant from within the US for a UK Fulbright Award. Um, again, so, someone's asking if we could, you could speak a bit more about what we mean by cultural exchange, and is this looking at a good match between projects and university, or is it something more than this? 
that is a very uh, big question. By cultural exchange, I mean when you go to a different culture, to a different country, you will come into contact with that culture. Uh, so that this is this is what it means. In terms of what we're looking for, we're looking for willingness for you to engage with a different con uh, country and its culture. Now, there are different ways to do that. So again, we can probably talk for hours about it, uh, but I would probably say, go to our website, have a look at our statement, have a look at our um, values, have a look at what our grantees have done so far. And then, you know, if you want to have a further discussion, uh, please email us or join us at the next uh, webinar. Um, we'll probably take a couple uh, more questions and then we will be wrapping up. Yeah, I'm just trying to this through. Um, I know, again, I think I know there will, we will be doing future webinars, isn't that right, Angelina? There's going to be. Yes, yeah. Ones. Um, sorry. Um, uh, someone has asked what our top tips for a strong application are. Um, I'm going to probably repeat myself, read the instructions and read our website. Think about why Fulbright, especially if you're invited to the interview. If you're invited to the interview, it means that you know your kind of academic side is great, it's all fine, we know that you know what you're doing. Think about why you're interested specifically in us. Um, uh, this uh, there's another question about um, it's been mentioned that we it's important to give a strong case as to why you've chosen your particular host university but the application website and I believe this is the main for application website instructs people not to name their um, university um, how can they make this case I think Angelina you best place to answer yes this is why you need to read our country specific instructions uh, everyone needs depending on where they're applying from the country they're applying from they need to have access to their in-country specific instructions uh, because the system is the same for everyone but different commissions have different requirements yes so some Fulbright commissions place their grantees at universities and they don't have a choice in which universities they attend so obviously the application needs to make room for that whereas we really like to see you make a case for a university so make sure you read those instructions on our website we've got time for a couple more are we let's yeah 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 let's okay so we've got a couple about um scholars hosting letters uh one is asking what we mean specifically by a host affiliation letter uh, mm -hmm. and another one asking what sort of information they would expect to see in that host letter Sure. So the host affiliation letter is a is a is a letter from the academic or the department that you wish to uh, be hosted in. Um, it is on university letterhead, um, official university stationery. Um, it can be still a digital letter, but it needs to be uploaded to the application. Um, information that we need in it is we need it to say that they are happy to host you, and we need it to say when. So have some preliminary grant dates included in that letter so that we know that they're happy to host you when they when you say you want to go and do your grant. That's the most important thing right now. We'll take one more for both of us. Um, perhaps, this, yeah, so we've got a couple of questions about the interview process. Um, one asking how many people we basically short this interview and second one asking like who will be, who will candidates be interviewed by and what kind of questions will the interview consist of and what will be the format? Well, I'm not going to answer most of that because I can't really tell you what the questions will be, unfortunately, until you're invited to the interview. So please submit your application. Uh, in terms of who uh, interviews, so um, for the postgraduate awards, it will be myself, uh, one of my senior colleagues and a panel of our alumni. Uh, we do try to make sure that there is somebody who more or less specializes in your area, but at the same time, someone who does not, because we will be checking um, as Samuel has already mentioned, that you are able to communicate your um, ideas to non-specialized uh, specialized audience. Um, I don't, I just, this is a kind of place, I wonder if um, it's possible to speak about, like there's a few questions about whether we're going to be running other webinars and so on, so I wonder if it, um, Angelina, it's possible to just go through what future webinars we might be running during the course of the application process. Sure. So I think that is a fantastic question. It's going to be the last one. <laughs> so there will be more webinars. Uh, the plan is to have two more in September. So one will be specifically for postgraduate awards and the other one will be specifically for scholars. Uh, in my next webinar, I will be looking um, at the selection process, which will be more about the actual application, uh, what you sort of what information you provide, then how we select 
um, our interview candidates, who reviews those applications, how we interview, what to expect from the process, and sort of like all those details. Uh, so we will be posting more information on our website. Uh, please make sure that you read our emails and that you sign up for those webinars. Um, Sam, is there anything else you want to add? Um, is, is this... Nothing, nothing from me. But please email in questions for um, that we've not been able to answer, as long as they're specific to the awards program. If you have more general questions, send them to the advising team, and uh, hopefully we can provide more information later. And looking forward to seeing you at other webinars, I guess. Well, yeah. Thank you to everyone for attending. It's it's been great that so many of you have stayed here for like the whole hour. Uh, the first lesson thing I've learned is Angela needs to talk less because there are a lot of questions. So we will probably have slightly longer webinars for you to have more opportunities to ask questions. Unfortunately, we won't be taking any more tonight. Uh, again, as Sam has just said, please, please, please email us. Uh, we're always happy to help you via email. We're not taking phone calls at the moment. And we will be seeing you probably in September at our next webinar. Thank you. Mm -hmm.